wonder if I can change my. Um... Whoop. I'll get us going here. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to July's uh, Healthy Aging Lecture. My name is Kate. I'm the manager in the senior health department at Virginia Hospital Center, and my coworker, Blanca, is here um, also. Hello, Blanca. Um, and today we have a great lecture on foot and ankle health, um, and I'm going to introduce our speaker in just one moment. Um, but I wanted to, um, for those of you who are new to this webinar, I wanted to remind you or, or update you on a few housekeeping tips. First of all, everybody has joined um, today's webinar in listen-only mode, just to help reduce that background noise. Um, but you all should have a question box, or it, maybe it says chat, but it, it should appear over in the control, control panel. So we really encourage you to go ahead, open up that chat box, and type in your questions as we're going along. We, um, we definitely will get to them towards the end of the presentation. And I, of course, want to remind everyone that this webinar and all our webinars are recorded. So I will be sending this, um, this presentation, I will actually include the slides, as well as the recording of this presentation afterwards, um, later today or early next week. So you're welcome to um, listen to it again. And I just want to remind everyone, if there's any lecture that you missed throughout the last few months or whenever, um, or you forgot to register for, we also have recordings of those. So contact me or Blanca, just contact our senior health department. We would love to um, send that over to you. Of course, all our webinars are free to the community. So um, with that, I'm going to uh, take a minute to introduce our speaker today. We are joined by Dr. Matthew Buchanan, who is a board certified orthopedic surgeon. Hello, Dr. Buchanan. Um, he has dedicated his career, his practice, to foot and ankle care and has quite an extensive um, body of knowledge and experience. I can't possibly go through all of it, but he is affiliated with the Nurshall Orthopedic Center, I should say works for. Um, so I encourage you to definitely go to that website and check out his um, background and, and all that he's done. His office, at least one of the offices, is located here on the main campus of VHC. Um, but in general, Dr. Buchanan has extensive experience in total ankle replacement. I'm sure we'll hear a little bit about that today. But he is one of a few group of select surgeons that has received certification to perform um, four FDA treatments related to ankle replacement. So perhaps you can tell us about that a little bit. He's also very much um, has a lot of experience around minimally invasive surgery, bunion corrections, sports injuries, traumatic injuries, kind of runs the gamut. So um, we really appreciate you being here today, Dr. Buchanan. And I'm going to, at this time, turn it over to you and let you take it away. And as a reminder, please send us your questions. We will monitor those and, and get to them towards the end of the presentation. Thank you, Dr. Buchanan. Thanks so much, Kate. And thanks for uh, taking the time to uh, set this up. And thanks to all of you who are taking time out of your day to, uh, to tune in. So today we're talking about tips and strategies to keep your feet and ankles healthy, uh, but also pain free. So a little bit uh, more about me. I love the outdoors. So I love anything outdoors, whether it's whitewater kayaking, hiking, cycling, running, so in 2016, uh, on a whim, uh, one of my orthopedic residency buddies called me and said, hey, I've got the perfect job for you. Come move down to Chattanooga, Tennessee. So I had been in the DC area for nine years. And then in 2016, we moved down to Chattanooga. We got to enjoy all that Chattanooga has to offer. So I've got two boys, 14 and 10. My wife loves the outdoors as well. But we were down there for three years, and honestly, after three years, we just really missed the D.C. area. So I think we took the D.C. area for granted. We missed the amazing people and opportunities. So we moved back uh, in 2019, right before the pandemic. So a little bit more about me. I went to Duke undergrad, Ohio State for uh, medical school. I went to West Virginia University for a five-year orthopedic sur uh, surgery residency. And then I did a one year foot and ankle fellowship. So as you may know, as an orthopedic surgeon, you have the opportunity 
to do an extra year of training called a fellowship. And there are a lot of opportunities and options. I could have been a joint replacement specialist. I could have been a hand surgeon. I could have been a trauma surgeon, but I chose foot and ankle. And I often get the question, why did you choose foot and ankle? In my mind, the foot and ankle subspecialty encompasses all that orthopedic has to offer. We can fix fractures. We can correct deformities, just like the sports doctors. We see a lot of sporting injuries. We can scope joints. We can do joint replacements. And we'll talk a little more about that in a, a few slides later. And we also treat arthritis. So I've, not only is it one of the newer specialties and the body of knowledge is expanding rapidly, it's also, uh, in my mind, I thought one of the more exciting options. And as many of you may know, if you're living with foot pain, if you and I can come up with a solution to your foot pain, you're gonna be pretty darn happy. So the goals of our talk today, we wanna polish up on a little bit of anatomy so you understand the anatomy of the foot and why things can go wrong. We're gonna talk about some of the common sources of foot and ankle pain, and then we're gonna talk about treatment. So let's look at the anatomy. The foot is an absolutely incredible structure. 28 individual bones in the foot, 33 joints. And you can imagine if just one of those little bones has a problem, you're gonna be limping, you're gonna have pain, it's really gonna affect your quality of life. So what connects all those little bones together? The answer to that question is ligaments. And you can see on my diagram here, the ligaments are these white bands of tissue that connects our bones together. What moves our foot? The foot is moved through tendons. So tendons are like ropes. And here's a picture of some of the tendons on the outside of our foot and ankle. These are connected to muscles up in our leg. So when your brain tells your foot to move, the muscle shortens or lengthens, which is connected to the rope. And just like a puppet, that's going to move your foot. So we've got bones, ligaments, tendons, arteries, veins, and we've got five major nerves that cross our ankle into our foot. So uh, very, very interesting, and I would say complex anatomy. As a structure, the foot is able to withstand a tremendous amount of stress and forces that we put it through. So if you go out in the neighborhood and go for a walk and you're a 200 pound man, let's say, every step you're taking, you're putting 300 pounds of, of weight that goes across your foot. So think of all those tiny little bones and the type of forces that they are under, even with walking, it's, it's pretty incredible. Uh, each year, we our feet log approximately a thousand miles. So that's like you leaving your house today and walking down to Miami, Florida. And if you exercise strenuously for 60 minutes, your feet as a shock absorber absorb up to a million pounds of pressure. So truly a phenomenal structure. And you can imagine how things can go wrong. Let's talk first about shoes. So unfortunately, we have a lot of negative role models in the media when it comes to shoes. And you know, yes, maybe we can make some kind of an argument that those shoes maybe look good, but I can tell you as an orthopedic foot and ankle surgeon, they can do a lot of damage. So let's look at this picture here and what a high heel is doing to your foot. So as we elevate the heel, all your body weight is coming down to the ball of your foot. So what that does is stretches out those ligaments on, on the ball of your foot, and that can lead to a hammer toe. The other problem is that tight toe box is also gonna stretch out ligaments on the inside of your big toe, and that's gonna lead to a bunion. So you can see here, this is kind of a crazy looking foot, but you would acknowledge that it probably fits pretty well in this dress shoe. And unfortunately, women are affected a little bit more than men, so nine out of 10 women are wearing shoes that are too small for their feet. And eight out of 10 women say that the shoes that they wear are actually painful. And we're gonna talk about that. So here's a picture of a normal foot on the left and, and a bunion on the right. So with a normal foot, the big toe is, is aligned properly and the ligaments and tendons are in good balance. As we stretch out those ligaments on the inside of our big toe, 
you'll notice that the tendon that pulls your big toe up and down is now out of alignment. So it's not in line with that joint. So when that tendon works by pulling, it's actually gonna pull and make the bunion worse. So the natural history of bunions is once you have one, they do tend to get worse as time goes on. So the other question I get a lot is, doctor, why did I develop a bunion? And there's really two answers, one of which is shoe wear. So they have done these really neat population studies. There's groups of people across the world that from birth on, they never wear shoes. And they compared that same population to a, an equal population that's wearing shoes. And just by wearing shoes, we're 70 times more common to get bunions than if we never wore shoes our entire life. So there's definitely shoes play a role. And then the other one is our genetics. So uh, this is a study of 108 patients. 84 patients with bunions had, had a positive family history. So if your mom has a bunion, your aunt has a bunion, good chance you know, you're likely to develop one as well. So where do we start with treatment of bunions? For sure, number one, we're gonna talk about shoes. So I tell people, organize your closet. Pain is the enemy. Donate shoes or throw them away if they're worn out that hurt. We want you to be in shoes that are pain free. Uh, the other trick I like to do in the office, I'll have a patient take their shoe off, step on a piece of paper, I'll trace the outline of their foot, and then I'll set their shoe on top of that tracing. Many times their foot extends beyond the tracing. So that tells us you're in shoes that are too tight. So the first thing we wanna do is make sure you've got a shoe that's fitting properly. That comes to my happy feet tip number one today. Sounds like common sense, but we talk about it all the time in the office. Don't wear shoes that hurt. Okay, so let's say you've done the shoe thing. You come back to see me, you're like, it's still, my feet are still hurting me. There are some additional tips and tricks we can do for painful, let's say a painful bunion. This is a bunion stretcher. So there's many of these on the market. It's designed to help stretch that big toe straight. Is it gonna magically make your bunion disappear? No, but is it gonna help maybe prevent it from getting worse? Yes, and that's important. There's also toe spacers, there's splints. So there's all kinds of things. If you saw them in the office, we could talk about. The other thing we wanna look at is I always like to look at the bottom of someone's foot because it really does, does tell us a story. So sure enough, this patient does have a bunion, but what we notice is they have a big callus underneath their second metatarsal. So in the ball of the foot, we see a callus. Calluses are not normal. That's a sign of increased pressure that the foot is dealing with. Um, so it may be a situation where we want to make a custom orthotic. That could really alleviate your pain. Uh, we may want to put a little metatarsal pad in there. That's going to take a little bit of pressure off of that sore spot. So there are a lot of simple things we can do to help alleviate some of this pain. Uh, we're going to look at your arch height too. Are you someone with a normal foot? If you go to the pool and you get out of the pool and you step on the pool deck, what kind of shape or imprint is your foot leaving on the pool deck? Do you have a flatter foot? Do you have a high arch? There is definitely a link with a flatter feet and bunion. So again, we may be talking about a custom orthotic. And then what about surgery? Again, surgery is a last resort. You and I are gonna talk about all the non-surgical stuff first. But where are we in 2021 when it comes to bunion technology in terms of surgery? We've got a lot of minimally invasive options now that we never had before. So now we're fixing bunions through tiny incisions. Look how small these incisions are. So that's an incision, that's an incision. So we're talking about literally tiny poke holes. Oftentimes these incisions are so small they don't even need a stitch. Through the incision, we're inserting, and this is where the technology is really neat. These are burrs, much like the bit on a Dremel that literally can remove the painful bumps. They can also cut the bones and we can reshape the foot back to normal, which we're doing in this diagram. And then we can secure that new foot position with these titanium screws that are headless that are inside your bone that holds that correction. So there's really some exciting minimally invasive options for 
for all of foot, foot surgery, but particularly for bunion surgery. And here's an example of that. So this is a patient that had a mild to moderate bunion. You can see the bump. This is her x-ray. This is afterwards. So you can appreciate that we've cut the bone, we've narrowed the foot, that we've straightened the toe and really removed that bump and we've fixed it with two screws. And we've done all that through these two tiny incisions. Here's another example. This is admittedly a bigger bunion, so it's a little more of a severe deformity. Um, and what we're doing here, same thing. We're shaving the bump, we're pushing the bone over. Think of the analogy that I like is this is a scoop of ice cream sitting on top of the ice cream cone. We're disconnecting the scoop, we're pushing it over towards the rest of the foot, and then we're securing that with these titanium screws all through tiny incisions. And so this is the picture in surgery. This is a before picture, and this is after. She does have a little bump here. That bump is from her stretched out skin. That eventually goes away. But you can see that we've fixed this again through these teeny tiny little incisions. But notice how much straighter her toe is now. And notice that it's no longer uh, mal-rotated. So her toe in this picture, you can really see is twisted, which is a normal occurrence with bunions. And with this minimally invasive surgery, we can also straighten the toe out. What about hammer toes? So no talk about, you know, happy feet is complete without mentioning hammer toes. If you have a bunion, oftentimes you will also have hammer toes because we have five toes, as you can imagine. The big toe is big and strong for a reason. Half your body weight should go through your big toe when you push off. But if you have a bunion, it's the big toe is not working mechanically like it should. So that puts too much stress on the little toes. So when you have a hammer toe, they're gonna hurt on top. You're gonna develop painful calluses on the top of your foot. You may develop a painful callus on the ball of your foot. And that's because when the toe pulls up, it pulls the padding with it. See how there's no padding anymore underneath this metatarsal bone? That's because all the padding is up here where it's not really very helpful. And when you lose the padding, your foot develops a callus. Calluses are very painful. They're thick. It's like stepping on a rock. There's all kinds of tips and tricks we can talk about, about how to remove a callus. Here's where you might see these calluses on the ball of your foot. We've got uh, the metatarsal pads. Again, we may recommend to take away some of that pressure. This is called a Budin splint. It's a common device used to design to help straighten a hammer toe. And of course, there's surgery to straighten these toes out. We may recommend a surgery. Sometimes we pin toes during the recovery process, but not always. There's also a lot of minimally invasive options for uh, correcting hammer toes. This is a situation where a hammer toe has gone on far too long and the ball and socket joint has actually dislocated. So severe hammer toes will cause the toe to actually pop up on top of the foot. So that's something that we can also correct surgically, but we like to catch that early uh, before that happens. So happy feet tip number two. If you see a lot of calluses on your feet, that's not normal. If the calluses is between the toes, it's probably because your shoes are too tight. If it's on the ball of your foot, there's probably something going wrong mechanically with your foot. And I would recommend uh, seeing a doctor and evaluating your foot and the mechanics to see why you have a callus. Let's switch gears and talk about fractures. So as we're all active in the summer and we're out hopefully doing some walking and hiking, uh, we are seeing a lot of broken, broken ankles, but also broken uh, metatarsals. So the fifth metatarsal is on the outside of your foot. It's the most frequently fractured metatarsal. Uh, it's a common pattern we see time and time again. This fifth metatarsal is the bone below your pinky toe. It can be broken in a variety of ways, uh, which I'm gonna show you. These are three different areas of that bone where you can have a fracture. This is probably the most common. It's at the base of that bone. It's a little hairline crack. Um, when you injure your foot, it's gonna be that same story of rolling your ankle. So it's gonna be missing a curb, missing a step, uh, when your ankle rolls, you, you may look like you have an ankle sprain because a lot of times the two go together. 
but actually where your pain is, is in your foot. So this is what we call an avulsion fracture. Um, it generally does really well. A lot of times we can treat you in one of these boots. Good news is we're gonna let you walk on that boot. So we're not gonna, we'll try not to slow you down too much. This is another fracture pattern in the fifth metatarsal. This one's a little more serious. It's called a Jones fracture. It has a bad reputation of taking a long time to heal. It's in a slightly different location where the blood supply to the foot is not quite as good. So if you have a Jones fracture, your treatment may be a little uh, more conservative, a little more strict. Uh, we try to avoid cast, but sometimes we're even gonna cast you for this fracture. If you're a high level athlete, uh, and you have a Jones fracture, you're gonna have surgery. The reason why is you're gonna get back to your sport much, much quicker uh, if you have surgery to secure that fracture. And that statement I just made is supported by lots of good research studies. This is probably the first one back in 2005 that really taught us for professional or collegiate or even high school athletes, they get back to play much quicker with Jones fractures if you do surgery. And then what about dancer's fractures? This is an oblique fracture, uh, meaning kind of a long angular fracture in the shaft of the bone. This generally heals quite well, <coughs> excuse me, and, and oftentimes does not require surgery. So that takes me to happy feet tip number three. I want you to avoid these common mechanisms that cause these type of fractures. So flip-flops and shoes, you gotta be careful. A lot of times I see people come into the office and they say, Doc, I was walking in my flip flops or I was walking in my dress shoes. So the dressier the shoe or, you know, if you're in an unstable flip flop, be careful. The other mechanism we hear a lot is missing a step. Stairs are dangerous. Be careful on stairs, particularly when you're carrying things on stairs. So carrying a load of laundry where you can't see the stairs, that's dangerous. So don't carry laundry in your dress shoes or your flip-flops. That's a recipe for disaster. Uh, also watch out for wet grass. Amazing how many people come in and tell me they slipped and fell on wet grass. And finally, walking the dog. I see so many injuries when people are walking their dog. So just be cautious, uh, you know, let the leash go loose before the dog pulls you down. Uh, what about stress fractures? This is probably the pandemic uh, injury that we saw more, more than any other is what's called a stress fracture. So what I just showed you is a real fracture, like snapping a two by four in half. Stress fractures are different. That's like taking a, um, a coat hanger and starting to wiggle it. As you wiggle it more and more, you'll notice the metal starts to turn colors. That's a stress fracture. So the coat hanger hasn't snapped, but the metal has started to change colors. Stress fractures can occur in any bone of the foot. So all those 28 bones can develop a stress fracture. Most commonly, it's in the metatarsal bones. These are the long, skinny bones that are in the middle of your foot. This is an x-ray of a classic stress fracture in the second metatarsal. This is what we call a march fracture, meaning a military re recruit goes off to boot camp. They go from video game playing couch potato to hiking miles and miles each day at boot camp. That's a recipe for a stress fracture. So the other um, thing to know about stress fractures is your initial x-ray is often negative. So patients will go to the urgent care, they'll have a painful foot, they'll be limping, uh, their foot will be swollen and they get the x-ray at the urgent care and it's negative. And then that's a classic story. Two weeks later, we do, we do another x-ray. We're gonna see this bulge of bone right here. That's a stress fracture. So what can predispose you to a stress fracture? The pandemic. Everybody stopped going to gyms. They stopped cross training and all they did was walk. Walking's a great exercise unless you're doing it every single day to the extreme. And all of a sudden you're gonna look down and say, you know, my foot's starting to hurt. And I've noticed some swelling in my foot. So training errors um, is really what causes stress fractures. New exercise program. Maybe you signed up for that 5K and you're starting to train and you're training a little too much. Um, so that can do it. You may be low in vitamin D. Uh, you may have a poor diet. So you may not be getting enough protein. Our bodies need protein to heal. 
So if you're protein malnourished, you won't heal. So make sure breakfast, lunch, dinner, especially if you're exercising a lot, that you're getting protein. And don't forget lack of sleep. Sleep is really when our bodies heal them ourselves. So if we're starting a new exercise program or our activity is going up, make, make sure you're balancing that out with a lot of sleep. And then of course there's you know anatomical differences about our feet that can predispose us one person to another. Maybe you have a tight calf muscle. Maybe one of your foot bones, you were born with it longer than it than normal. So there's some anatomic um, conditions that can predispose you to a stress fracture. Most of the time, the, acti the uh, treatment is pretty straightforward. I'm gonna slow you down. We're gonna talk about cross training. I think it's great that you're walking five days a week, but maybe that's too much. Maybe you walk on Monday. Tuesday, you do water walking in the pool. Maybe Wednesday is a cycling day. So mix it up, slow down, get into physical therapy. Maybe if it's bad enough, we'll put you in a boot. And in rare cases, we're gonna get out these fancy bone stimulators, maybe a cast, maybe crutches. So lots of options. The, the key is catch it before it develops into something serious. So happy feet, tip number four, don't abuse your feet with overtraining. And so how are you gonna know that? Pain and swelling are the enemy. So don't train so much that your foot is hurting uh, and swollen because you may be causing a stress fracture. What about your, your, your foot shape? Let's say you one day look down at your feet, you say, hey, you know, my foot is collapsing, my arch is collapsing. I wanna let you know that that's not normal. Arches do not naturally collapse as time goes on. So that may be a reason to see a doctor if you sense that your arch is collapsing. When we talk about the arch, what structures are important and necessary to hold up our arch, uh, down on the bottom right, I want you to look at the ligaments. So this is the inside of your ankle and foot. There are very important ligaments here. This is called the spring ligament right here that supports our arch. So it may be that over time, these ligaments are becoming torn. On top of the ligaments, we have tendons. So there's a very important tendon that comes right along. This is the inside of our ankle. Uh, it's called the posterior tibial tendon. It hooks into the the middle of our arch and it supports our arch. So if you have a problem with that tendon, uh, your arch may be collapsing and it may be painful. So there's four stages to, ha to having a flat foot. Stage one is kind of the beginning. Uh, you can see here you're developing some pain on your arch, on the inside of your ankle, but you still have good strength. You can still get up on your tiptoes and walk around, but it's starting to hurt. This is where we like to catch it. We like to catch it early. If you're a runner, we're gonna slow you down. If, you, if you're not a runner, you know, we may put you in a little boot just as a period of rest to let that tendon calm down. I'm definitely gonna get you into some physical therapy. Maybe we're gonna make an orthotic. Stage one is pretty easy to fix. That's why I say, come see me sooner before it develops into something serious. More serious is stage two. That's where your tendon is starting to get stretched and maybe even torn. So here's a, a diagram of a torn, you know, starting to become torn tendon. So you have this flat foot, but all of a sudden now you can't get up on your tiptoes. So we want to prevent damage to the tendon by catching these problems early. And if you're at stage two, don't worry, we still have good treatment options. We can put you in a boot. We can still do therapy. Maybe we're going to do some kind of a brace. Uh, again, don't get nervous. I don't use this type of brace ever, but it's an example, example of some custom braces that we can use to help you. And then stage three and stage four are more serious, more involved. Uh, but the idea is get in early. So happy feet tip number five, call your doctor. Come see me if your arches are collapsing. Um, again, no talk about happy feet is complete without talking a little bit about heel pain. What are some things that can cause pain in your heel? Many of you may be aware of this, plantar fasciitis. So what is the plantar fascia? Well, getting back to our anatomy, as we talked about these incredible bones, the bones come together and make an arch, much like a bow and arrow. What connects the ends of the arch together is called your plantar fascia. 
and your plantar fascia you can see on this diagram here is like a ligament and it hooks into your heel this is the weak spot it hooks into your heel but it also goes all the way up to all your toes so the weak spot is down here at your heel because where it hooks in at your toes is a much broader wider insertion so when if you get out of bed in the morning and this is the face that you make as your heel hits the ground you may have plantar fasciitis so it's first step in the morning it's also what we call startup pain where you're just you know you're resting for a while and you get up again uh, incredibly painful uh, incredibly common uh, so how do we treat this we have a ton of options so we can talk about activity modification anti-inflammatory medicines we have nighttime splints that give your foot a little stretch while you sleep we love physical therapy uh, this is a plantar fascial specific stretch it's called the cross leg stretch you cross your leg you pull your toes back your your other hand massages your plantar fascia in your heel you hold that stretch for two minutes and you do that three times a day i tell patients get a lacrosse ball set it on the ground use it as like deep tissue massage to the bottom of your foot it's like having a therapist in your pocket and they and you can really use that ball much like a therapist would use their thumbs to massage your plantar fascia maybe if this has gone on a long time we might talk about custom orthotics often we can just send you to the running shoe stores where you can get a pretty good over-the-counter arch support um, we can you know rarely we'll try cortisone shots this is one of the night splints maybe if it's bad enough we'll do a boot or a cast sometimes we want to order an mri scan here's why maybe your heel pain is not plantar fasciitis maybe you have a stress fracture in your calcaneus and this is an mri scan of that everything about this mri is normal except for this little squiggly dark line that is a stress fracture in the heel bone that should not be there so maybe your pain is a stress fracture and that's a relatively easy fix with a boot versus you know repetitively sending you back to physical therapy so uh, come see me there's lots of things that we can do if i had to summarize one tip for a happy foot when it comes to plantar fascia uh, problems i would say don't wear old shoes if you're an avid walker or maybe a jogger Go to the running shoe store, make sure you get a good supportive shoe and try on some of their over-the-counter arch supports because many times that can make a huge difference. What's the other thing that causes heel pain? Your Achilles tendon. So this is pain on the back of your heel. So it's not the bottom of the heel, it's the back of the heel. And you can have all kinds of problems with your Achilles tendon. You can get bone spurs back here. You can get bursitis. What's bursitis? A bursa is a small fluid filled sac like this one right here or these two back here. There's actually two that are associated with the back of your heel. So you can get inflammation of that bursa. You can get irritation of the tendon. And of course, probably the most well-known injury to the Achilles tendon is you can rupture your Achilles tendon. So even though the Achilles tendon is the largest tendon in the human body, and it can withstand forces up to a thousand pounds, it's also the most frequently ruptured tendon. So fun fact, Brad Pitt, when he was uh, playing Achilles in the movie Troy, during the filming of that movie, he actually ruptured his Achilles tendon. So sure enough, just like this diagram shows, you know, as you know, you can rupture your tendon. It's not very common. Uh, it's a little more dramatic than most of the Achilles tendon issues that we see. Uh, this is an MRI scan of a ruptured tendon. So here's the upper portion of that tendon, which is this black, kind of looks like the end of a mop almost, or a rope. Here's the lower end. What's connecting it in between? The answer is nothing. So this should be a black line all the way down there. So this is the MRI of a ruptured tendon. Um, you don't always need surgery if you rupture your Achilles, but if you think you've ruptured your tendon, get in to see me. Uh, there's great non-surgical treatment for most people with Achilles ruptures. The key is we want to catch it quickly. Uh, if, if you're more athletic and you want to get back to your high-impact sports, running, tennis, racquetball, et cetera, 
um, then we're probably going to recommend surgery. Uh, the good news is we're doing it all through tiny incisions. So much like our minimally invasive bunion surgery, we do minimally invasive Achilles repair, very, very small incision. We use these really neat devices that allow us to pass suture through tiny, tiny poke holes. And then all of this can be repaired through about a one inch incision. And the good news is whether or not you do uh, surgery to fix your Achilles tendon or non-surgery, this was a study in 2006, both patient groups, surgery or not, do much better in a boot walking on it as soon as possible versus a cast. So if I put you in a boot and let you walk on it immediately, um, you get back to walking faster. There's no increased complications. So, uh, you know, casting an Achilles rupture is sort of old fashioned. We actually want to kind of get you up and get you moving, but there's caveats to that. We want to make sure that you're in a proper boot with a heel lift uh, and that we're doing therapy correctly. So if you suspect Achilles rupture, you got a friend that has one, uh, let me know. So happy feet tip number seven, don't play pickup basketball with teenagers. And what I mean by that is if you're not playing basketball throughout the week, don't all of a sudden go do something totally different that's very, very high impact that you don't normally do. And if you are going to play pickup basketball with teenagers, don't give 110%. So I would probably play, if it was me, I'd probably play at you know, 60, 70%. Um, so just be careful doing things, even like singles, tennis, anything explosive like that if you're not doing it you know frequently be careful if you go out all of a sudden just do it one time uh, and then we must talk about ankle sprains uh, an ankle sprain is a tear of this is actually the most commonly torn ligament in the human body so if you roll your ankle look what happens between the distance from your fibula to your foot uh, you're increasing that distance you're tearing that ligament Again, the number one most commonly torn ligament in the human body. Uh, your, initially, your ankle may look like this, or so a more severe sprain is gonna have a lot of bruising and swelling. Uh, you're, we're gonna start what we call phase one rehab. That's, that's the RICE, R-I-C-E. R is we're gonna rest it. So we may put you in a boot, may put you in a brace. The I is ice. I love getting a five gallon bucket of water, fill it up with ice and water and dunk your ankle in there for 20 minutes. Uh, compression would be like a compression sock can be very helpful to control the swelling. And certainly early on, you're gonna wanna elevate. If you're someone who's able to take ibuprofen, that's gonna help in the initial phases to keep your pain down. Uh, and the number one goal with an ankle sprain is we don't want you to be someone that has chronic instability. So I don't want you to have a loose ankle that all of a sudden you don't trust. Many of my patients say, you know, I can't even walk across a bumpy field without being nervous that I'm going to roll my ankle. So that's what we're trying to avoid. Ways to avoid that. Uh, we may put you in, in various types of braces to, during the healing process to make sure it doesn't roll. I definitely want to get you into physical therapy. Let the experts get their hands on you. They're gonna do lots of balance exercises with you. The stronger you make all your balance muscles, the less likely you are to sprain it again in the future. And if you're anxious to get back to, let's say a sport or some other type of activity, the therapist is really the best person to tell you when you're ready to go back to, let's say exercise walking. So ankle sprains are unbelievably common. You know, one study quoted 25,000 ankle sprains a day. The problem is about 20% or one in five have associated injuries. So the associated injuries are various fractures. So you may have actually caused a fracture in the ankle or in one of the foot bones. Uh, you may have a high ankle sprain, which is damage to ligaments above the ankle. So the high ankle sprain is where you tear the ligaments between the leg bones. That's a, often a little more serious injury. Uh, you may have damaged your cartilage and you may have actually torn or dislocated a tendon. So, you know, get evaluated early if it seems to be a pretty significant injury to try to avoid some long-term problems because about two in, out of five ankle sprains develop chronic problems. So that's where you know, I think if you if you get treated early, you're less likely to have a chronic issue. 
that issue that we're again trying to avoid one of them at least is chronic instability so i'll do a test on your ligaments in the office to see whether or not those ligaments healed properly so if they didn't heal properly you're going to have a loose ankle that you just don't trust which is happy feet tip number eight go to physical therapy if number one you have weak ankles or number two you suffered an ankle sprain because they're going to really guide you through that treatment process and i think you'll be much less likely to uh, have a problem and our final topic is ankle arthritis so if you've had a lifetime of ankle sprains or if when you were in your teen you know the teen years you had a nasty ankle fracture the problem with chronically spraining your ankle or having a bad fracture years ago is, is the damage to the cartilage. So how does that show up on an x-ray? It shows up as a loss of space. So normally when we do an x-ray, bones don't touch. So when I look at my x-ray, I should see a space between every one of your bones. That space is where the cartilage is. So as long as you have a nice space, that means your cartilage is good and you don't have pain. The reason why we have pain when we uh, lose our cartilage is bones are rich with nerve endings. So just like if you break a bone, that's incredibly painful. If you lose your cartilage, then bones grind together and that's very painful. So this is an x-ray example of someone that has lost their space. Their foot bone now grinds against their shin bone and that produces lots of pain. So how are we gonna treat that? Of course, we're always gonna try non-surgical stuff first. We're gonna talk about shoes. We may try a cortisone shot. We may wanna put you into an ankle brace. But if we try that for, let's say a year or more, and it's just not helping, there is awesome technology out there to really fix ankle arthritis. And that's an ankle replacement. So what's better? lately or let's say in 2021 when it comes to ankle replacements because ankle replacements have had bad reputations in the past but we're now on what we call uh, the fourth generation of technology which is much much better so what makes it better is if you're gonna have an ankle replacement i'm gonna do a 3d uh i'm gonna do a ct scan and that data is going to produce a 3d printed model which you can see right here that perfectly matches your anatomy. So that 3D printed model, I will bring to surgery. I will put that on your bones. Those models have uh, guide, guide holes for pins. So these pins are placed into your bone, the model is removed, and then the cut guide for my saw goes over top of these pins. So we used to guess to some degree exactly what the best cut angle was when we did ankle replacements. Now there's no guessing. Our CT scan and our 3D printed models tell us exactly how these cuts need to be made. This is an example of an ankle replacement. These are pounded into your bone, much like a nail pounded into, uh, into wood. So they get immediate stability. And the surface of them is rough and porous, much like a sponge. So your body, your bone will literally grow into this implant and make it your own. So that's the same on the shin bone side here. It's the same on the talus side, which is the foot bone, and it's separated by polyethylene or plastic. And so when the plastic rubs against the metal, no pain. So it's a great technology. Uh, this is one of my patients that had, again, severe bone rubbing on bone arthritis in her ankle. This is uh, after surgery, you see a beautiful space. The implant has grown into her bone. Uh, and this is something, quite honestly, you can pretty much walk on immediately. So the day of surgery, I'll put you in a cast and I'll let you walk on this immediately. Walking on it is actually a good thing. It, it impacts these pegs in this porous coating into your bones. So we actually encourage uh, weight bearing. Uh, so that leads to happy feet tip number eight. Don't live with foot and ankle pain. There are great solutions out there. Whether that solution involves surgery or not, oftentimes our number one goal is to get you feeling better, of course, without surgery. Um, so come to see me if you've got uh, feet and ankles that are hurting. Uh, so in conclusion, those eight tips, uh, don't wear shoes that hurt. Organize your closet, get rid of the shoes that you know every time you wear them are gonna hurt. Uh, calluses are not normal. So if you're experiencing calluses on your feet that are painful, 
uh, come see me, we can fix that. Uh, watch out for those injury mechanisms we talked about. These are patterns that I see time and time again coming into the office, so uh, just be cautious. Uh, don't abuse your feet. So if you're training a lot and walking, exercising a lot, and they hurt and they're swollen, you may be causing a stress fracture. Uh, if you look down one day and, and think your arches are collapsing, that's not a good thing. So come to see me. We'll do some physical therapy and some arch supports and uh, get those arches corrected. Uh, throw away your old shoes. So if you've got shoes that are, are old and worn out and hurting, make a trip to the running shoe store, get some good shoes that you can walk and stand in so your feet don't hurt. Uh, this is common sense, but don't play pick up basketball teenagers. And if you do, certainly don't give 110%. And finally, don't live with foot and ankle pain. So we got lots of great solutions to uh, make you feel better. So that is the end. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in. That final picture was uh, the Leaning Tower of Pisa. I say that your foot, your feet, they're your foundation. So if you've got a problem with the foundation, the whole building is affected. So come see me if you've got uh, foot and ankle issues. Thanks and thanks for tuning in. Thank you, Dr. Buchanan. That was wonderful. Just chock full of information. I feel like everyone on this webinar can probably relate to at least one of those tips, if not more. So some really practical, good advice. Thank you so much. We do have a collection of questions, so I'm just going to jump in and start fielding those to you, if that's okay. Yeah, um, please do. Okay, terrific. Um, let's start on bunion surgery. Um, question of how does the big toe bone grow back together? That's a great question. And the, uh, the human body is quite amazing. So when we cut that bone and we push it over, what we do to, to provide stability is that's the screw that you saw in the picture. This is where the body's amazing. Your body will literally grow those two back bones back together. So just like if you break a bone, your body's gonna grow it back together. In orthopedics, when we cut a bone and correct a deformity, the body will heal itself and that bone will grow back bone against bone. It's pretty neat. Okay, thank you. Another a question here related to plantar fasciitis. Do the shots, um, at what point should you consider steroid shots? And do those actually resolve the problem or is it more of a temporary fix? Great question. So plantar fasciitis is so common. For me, it's maybe our third option. So my first option, like we talked about, is shoes. Uh, I'm going to give you a good home stretching program. If you have a lot of morning pain, we're going to do a night splint. And if, if that doesn't work, my second option is typically uh, getting you off to physical therapy. I usually want to see patients come back from physical therapy and say, I'm still having really bad heel pain. That is the person I think is an ideal candidate for a cortisone shot. I would be a little cautious if we have people in the audience that are runners. We don't like to give cortisone shots in active runners. Uh, it can, in rare cases, weaken the plantar fascia where you can rupture the plantar fascia. But I would say if you've done physical therapy and it hasn't worked, come in to see me and let's do a cortisone shot. And then the other question, does it mask the pain or does it actually fix the problem? I think that the cortisone is a powerful anti-inflammatory. We know that it's not going to cure the problem, um, but quite honestly, you may have a friend or I've seen many patients who come in and one shot is all it takes to really knock that problem out. So they can be pretty powerful. And then, you know, I would say a fair number of the cases, one shot will make a big, big difference in improving your quality of life. Great. This is a question about um, barefoot shoes, which we do hear talked about a little bit uh, or quite a bit, depending on the circles you, you run in. Um, what's your opinion on those? So I think there are certain people out there that are structurally sound, that have very healthy feet and ankles, and they can wear like the Vibram five finger shoes that are really minimalist, or let's say they are just somebody that doesn't need much structure in their shoe. And I think that's great. So I think if someone has, you know, the ability to wear those types of shoes, they're not having pain, they're not having problems. I think that's great. The benefit of some of those types of shoes, the thought is 
you know, maybe it takes a little, you know, stress and pressure off your knees and your hips. If you're not pounding quite as much, let's say in those shoes, you're landing, you're doing a little more of a midfoot, forefoot loading. Um, that may be better for your knees and your hips or maybe even your back. So it's thought of being a little more natural. As a foot and ankle doctor, though, can certainly cause problems. So we've seen an increase in Achilles tendon issues because of those types of shoes, definitely an increase in you know, plantar fasciitis and stress fractures. So I would say they're not for everybody, but for a select group of people, they can be uh, just the right shoe. Great, thank you. Um, one of our um, audience members was interested in information about um, whether foot rollers are helpful and somewhat related also um, whether you can offer or maybe direct people to um, information around foot exercises, um, you know, that can help kind of maintain or improve your foot health. Oh, great. So my favorite website for feet is footeducation.com. And it's a great website that um, I've actually contributed some to. It's uh, peer reviewed. So it's it's put together by a group of orthopedic uh, foot and ankle surgeons. I think the data on there is easy to read and accurate. It talks about lots of different conditions. There are exercises on there that are, uh, you know, injury and, and specific to whatever type of problem you're having. So that would be my tip on uh, you know, the website. What was the other question, Kate? About rollers, foot rollers. Oh yeah. So I think, um, I think any type of massage device for the bottom of your foot, I think is wonderful. Um, what I tell a lot of people to get because it's inexpensive and I think works the best is a lacrosse ball. As you probably know, a lacrosse ball is a heavy, dense rubber ball. It's about the size of a tennis ball. I tell people, keep one by the side of your bed maybe keep one at work, keep one in a purse, keep one in a backpack or briefcase and set it on the ground and, and use it as like a therapist doing deep tissue massage, roll small circles, start at your heel and go all the way up to your toes and back. Uh, and then once you're done with your small circles, do some stripes. So I like lacrosse balls. Uh, the other common thing for foot pain, people take, they'll get a case of water at the grocery store and they'll take three or four of those bottles, open them up, pour a little bit out, and put three or four in the freezer. And that's a frozen mm. rolling pin for the bottom of your foot. So I think a lot of patients like that. Uh, the other tip is uh, you can get a Dixie cup, fill it with water, put three or four in your freezer, take them out one at a time, use that as an icing massage for the bottom of your foot. And as the ice melts, you can peel the paper away. So I think foam, you know, foot rollers, any type of massage thing like that are great. Terrific. I like the low budget kind of uh, therapies. That sounds good. <laughs> um, a couple questions related to shoes. Okay, we all know we got to get rid of the stilettos from the closet and the fancy dress shoes. But we were, did have a question related to um, Sketchers, wondering if those are generally okay, and also just in general, at what point should you look for a new pair of running shoes? Are there just some clear signs that your shoes are too old and you need to go out for some new ones? Yeah, there are, you know, if you're a runner or an active walker, a lot of times they say the lifespan on a shoe is anywhere from three to 500 miles. The other thing I hear is if you're really an avid walker, every six months you should probably be getting new shoes. Uh, you can look at the wear pattern on the bottom of your shoe. If you're losing the tread, I think it's time to get new shoes. Um, I am a proponent of going to the running shoe store mainly because of the number of shoes that you can try on. So I always tell people, go later in the day. Our feet swell as the day goes on. You're going to get a more accurate fit if you go later in the day. And the benefit of the running shoe store is you can try 20 different types of shoes on I'm not real brand specific. So I'd rather you try on 20 pairs of shoes, maybe five different brands, see which one fits your foot shape the best. Um, shoes like Skechers and stuff, I think are fine. In general, I think Skechers, you know, there's some great Skechers out there. You know, whether or not a certain pair of Skechers is going to be good for you is a little bit hard to say. But I do like you know, go to the experts, go to the running shoe stores, try on a wide variety. 
see what fits your foot the best. Great, thank you. Um, if you're someone who's had a sprained ankle, we have a person here who's had a sprained ankle and, um, and a broken fibula. They are wondering about the neoprene ankle wrap. Do those help with st stability, excuse me? I do like those. I think that it gives you that compression, even though there's not a lot of structure to it, patients tell me, and there's even some research to support, it does help you a little bit from a balance standpoint. I think some of the lace-up ankle braces probably give you a little more structural support, like if you're going to play a sport or if you're going to go for a hike or you're going to watch a sporting event on a grassy, uneven field. But I do think those neoprene ankle sleeves or elastic ankle sleeves, not necessarily neoprene, are a great place to start. Okay, very good. Let me just scan here a little bit more. Um, we have a, a couple questions kind of related to the sole of the feet. Um, some uh, Someone is experiencing just um, a lot of dryness and soreness, even though they moisturize. Um, others just are wondering if it's normal for the sole to kind of thicken over time. Can you just talk a little bit about the soles of our feet and, and kind of things to look for, ways to help health around that? Yeah, of course. So I would examine, much like I would if you came to see me, I would examine the bottom of your foot. I think what's not normal are calluses that are located in certain spots. So if you have some focal areas that are thick and hard, I think that's a problem. I think there's something mechanically going on there that's not normal. Uh, a good place to start is a lot of the callus control creams contain a product called urea, U-R-E-A. Most of them start off at 20% urea. They go up to 40%. That cream, urea, breaks down the keratin that makes up the callus. So you can start by applying urea if you've got thickened skin or even a callus. Once that urea starts to work on it and softens it, I like a lot of the skincare uh, products. One catalog that I like is called Pedifix, P-E-D-I-F-I-X. They have, they have the urea cream. They call it the callus control cream. They also have a lot of skin files. Think cheese grater for your skin. They're designed to remove that callus. If you're a little more adventurous, they actually have skin razors. So much like a razor for your face or legs, they have razors that are designed to shave off a very thin layer of skin. I would not recommend that if you have neuropathy or if you're a diabetic, uh, but if you have a younger family member that could help you with something like that, uh, maybe they could help you use the skin razor. If not, you're gonna be someone who's gonna do well with let's say a pumice stone or a skin uh, file. Uh, something like that will help soften the skin on the bottom of your foot and help remove some of those calluses. Wonderful. So we're nearing the end here. One quick question, Dr. Buchanan. Um, just, um, I know you have an office located on the VHC campus, correct? Do you want to give that address? And also, do you have a second office? We have an, an uh, audience member that's interested in where you're located. Oh, thank you. Yeah, we are on the VHC campus. We're in the 1715 building which is currently the building farthest north. We're right next to where the big construction project is ongoing. We're on the top floor, that's the fifth floor. So 1715 uh, North George Mason, uh, we're in suite 504. Uh, our phone number is 703-525-2200. So 703-525-2200. That is our only office to see one of our doctors, including myself. We do have physical therapy. Uh, we have therapy right across the hall, and we also have a therapy location in McLean. But the only spot where the doctors are practicing is on the VHC campus in that 1715 building. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Buchanan, and thank you everyone for all the questions. I know there were a few we, we didn't get to, but um, you know, we, can, we can possibly follow up and send some um, written follow-up on that. So 
Um, I want to thank everyone for joining us today for this um, lecture. Thank you so much, Dr. Buchanan, for all this terrific information. Um, next month, I hope you can all join us. We're going to be talking about the ABCs of Medicare. As you know, enrollment period is, is coming up very soon, so we're going to have an expert coming on to talk about that process and what to think about, what to look for, and, and, and how to sign up. So I encourage everyone to join us on August 27th for that discussion. All right. Well, again, thank you, everyone. We wish you a very happy weekend and hope to see you next month. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.